So let's talk about the ChIP-seq assay now, one of the most popular assays uh, for identifying TF binding sites across a genome. And so on the other hand, you have kind of, for lack of a better word, you have more modern, you have modern in vivo techniques like ChIP-seq, uh, whose primary goal is to again identify uh, in vivo uh, DNA sequences bound by particular transcription factors in this case. And so the general idea is that uh, in vivo in your cell, uh, at any given time, you might have you know, different transcription factors and other factors binding to their uh, target DNA sequences on the genome. And so uh, the idea is that you can uh, add chemicals like formaldehyde, which will basically cross-link uh, proteins or other you know, transcription factors to their target DNA sequence. Uh, the idea being that, of course, since uh, transcription factor DNA interactions are transient, uh, by cross-linking, you're basically fixing them in place uh, so that uh, TFs aren't really moving around and so you're really able to capture that uh, TF-DNA binding interaction. And so what happens after uh, cross-linking is that then you then fragment your genome. And so in theory, what you're going to end up with is a bunch of fragments of free DNA. Uh, and you're going to end up with a bunch of fragments uh, with your transcription factors bound to their target uh, DNA sequence. And then what's going to happen is that using an antibody, uh, typically like a monoclonal antibody uh, that you've made uh, to target your particular transcription factor of interest, you can pull down uh, DNA fragments that are bound by your transcription factor of interest, uh, which you can then uh, basically sequence, purify and sequence. And then what you do then is you have, what you should end up with is a bunch of reads, which correspond to regions of the genome that are proximal to where your transcription factor bound uh, the genome. And you can take those reads and align them against the genome um, and then basically do what's called peak calling, which is basically the task of ident identifying where across the genome you saw a lot more reads uh, that align to that region than you'd expect by chance, which then suggests that your particular transcription factor of interest is binding to that particular peak or that region. Um, in the sample that you uh, that you IP'd. And so uh, afterwards, so then you can basically do one of two things. Number one of which is um, through the peak calling process, you've basically identified um, regions across the genome where your TF is bound, uh, which is great. The second thing you can do is if you want to try to uh, qualitatively and semi-quantitatively characterize um, what are the general DNA binding preferences of your TF? You can take all of the different peaks uh, conceptually across the genome that you found your TF uh, to bind to, and you can basically align those peaks to each other. Uh, and you can basically build a big sequence alignment shown here on the right, um, where basically all of uh, what you're trying to what you're trying to do with this multiple sequence alignment is try to identify what the transcription factor's particular preferences for different bases are in different positions of its recognition site, essentially. And so, what are the, so ChIP-seq is a super popular way of uh, measuring TF-DNA interactions in vivo. Um, it has a number of limitations, namely that this whole procedure basically relies on your ability to uh, make a make or buy uh, a highly specific antibody that is both specific and efficient at capturing uh, your transcription factor of interest. Um, traditionally, you typically needed a lot of uh, you needed a lot of IP uh, DNA in order for ChIP-seq to work, um, and so you typically need to perform ChIP-seq on like millions of cells. Uh, in order to get enough uh, genomic sequence that's bound by your TF of interest in order for ChIP-seq to work. Um, another major limitation is that oftentimes uh, transcription factor binding is, is very context dependent. And so certain transcription factors, for example, will only activate under certain environmental con uh, conditions or stimuli. And so uh, depending on which, you know, what state your tissue or cells are in, when you perform the cross-linking, you may or may not have subjected those cells to the right conditions in order to give rise to the binding events that you might be looking for. And so you have to be very careful about 
you know, there, there is no such thing as just, you know, capturing all binding sites of a given transcription factor in the given type of cell at once. Um, oftentimes to really get a comprehensive view of uh, where a TF binds in the genome for even for one particular type of cell, you'd have to technically uh, do chip seek experiments on many different like conditions or under many different stimuli of the same cell type in order to really capture where that TF binds and interacts with uh, in different conditions. So what are the major challenges of using the ChIP-seq protocol to characterize transcription factors of interest is your ability to acquire antibodies that can recognize your TF. And so just for historical context, one of the uh, first procedures for developing monoclonal antibodies uh, was developed in 1975. And so some of the key insights they made in that study was that uh, you can, for example, immunize a mouse against a particular antigen and afterwards then extract out uh, and isolate B cells from the spleen, which produce antibodies uh, against your antigen. And uh, But the problem with doing that is that when you extract out these uh, antibody producing B cells, they collectively produce potentially many different antibodies against your antigen. And so problem number one is that, well, uh, if your goal is to develop, for example, a monoclonal antibody, you have basically a population, you can get a population of B cells that produce uh, multiple different antibodies, but it's hard to get production of one single monoclonal antibody uh, in isolation. Uh, the second problem you have is that uh, those cells are not immortal. And so they obviously have limited lifespan. And so if your goal is to produce a lot of, for example, antibody, um, it, it's going to be difficult with isolated uh with isolated B cells from, from the mouse. And so one of their key ideas was number one, that if you took, for example, uh, a B cell from an immunized mouse and you fuse it with, for example, an immortalized cancer cell line, uh, more specifically a myeloma cell, which is basically a cancer cell line uh, derived from a plasma B cell, then you could actually produce what's called a hybridoma cell, uh, which is basically a uh, and effectively uh, indefinitely multiplying antibody producing B cell uh, that could produce uh, basically the antigen that was originally produced from the B cell that was uh, fused with the myeloma cell. And the second observation they made was that the second key idea of their study was that uh, when you do this fusion between a collection of say myeloma cells and a collection of uh, B cells that were isolated from the spleen, uh, stimulated B cells that are producing antibodies against your antigen uh, fuse preferentially with the myeloma cells. And so in some sense, you're able to select out uh, cells that were not uh, stimulated by your antigen. And so, yeah, this was, this was basically the first study to uh, develop a procedure to generate high quality monoclonal antibodies. And so it's worth pointing out that nowadays uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, are generally they're generally generated by engineering uh, specific like producer cell lines with your antibody encoding genes uh, that you, for example, could have sequenced from your activated B cells. Uh, and so they don't use generally use this hybridoma technology, uh, but that's how that's how monoclonal antibodies were first developed. And so some of the problems, again, that you have with using antibodies uh, in the ChIP-seq protocol is that, number one, it, it turns out to be really hard to um, get a very a highly specific antibody because, for example, a lot of transcription factors uh, are part of larger um, families of transcription factors or they may share, like, for example, DNA binding domains that are highly similar with other unrelated transcription factors. And so part of the problem is that you know, you can develop an antigen, you're, sorry, you can develop an antibody against your transcriptor factor, but uh, it can be hard to find, to develop one that doesn't also cross-react or recognize TFs uh, that are not of interest to you. Um, if you actually can't, uh, you know, produce a very good, for example, monoclonal antibody against your TF, uh, there are alternatives. And so, for example, you can basically... 
uh, fuse a tag such as the HA or flag or V5 tag um, to your transcriptor factor of interest. Uh, and the benefit of that is that there are antibodies that uh, can recognize these different tags or epitopes uh, that you fuse to your TF. Uh, part of the problem with going down that road is that you can have kind of unintended kind of crosstalk between the uh, epitope that you fuse to your transcriptor factor of interest, um, which therefore leads to, for example, altered function or 3D conformation of your protein. Um, and also, you know, in some cases for in vivo studies, obviously it, it becomes harder to uh, make fusion proteins, for example. Um, another, con another consideration is that again, uh, you know, you have to kind of decide, do you want to use monoclonal versus polyclonal uh, antibodies? And I think from a <clears throat> practical perspective, part of the problem with using polyclonal antibodies is that uh, basically there's a lot of kind of technical variation between uh, batches of polyclonal antibodies. And so generally speaking, monoclonal antibodies are, are um, have less variation from batch to batch and therefore um, have less like data artifacts that you have to consider downstream. So besides the challenge of acquiring a good antibody against your TF of interest, some of the other challenges that you typically have to overcome are the amount of genomic material that you need to do a ChIP-seq experiment. And so typically, depending on the concentration of your uh, transcription factor and you know how frequently it binds across the genome, you might need on the order of like one to 10 million cells uh, is input into your ChIP-seq protocol in order to successfully get enough reads uh, to identify the binding sites. And the other typical problem is you need to decide what kind of control experiments you want to run. And so there's typically two different types of controls you would run with a ChIP-seq experiment. Uh, you might either use, for example, a non-specific uh, antibody, or you might just use um, general chromatin input. And so uh, one of the challenges of using, for example, non-specific antibodies are that uh, you typically tend to pull down uh, less DNA than specific antibodies. And so then you would therefore need to do some amplification uh, of your so-called target, uh, target genomic sequences, which then leads to gain potentially amplification bias. Uh, some of the reasons you need to do the control experiments are that uh, number one, uh, it's uh, in terms of the fragmentation step of the ChIP-seq protocol, uh, not all regions of the genome are equally likely to be fragmented. So for example, uh, open chromatin tends to be easier to fragment than others. Um, again, due to like sequencing bias or amplification bias uh, during sequencing, uh, there's variable sequencing efficiency across the genome. And finally, um, some transcription factors or certain domains present in transcription factors uh, are easy to be picked up by uh, antibodies that are not designed to specifically target them. And so uh, even if you think your monoclonal antibody is highly specific, it may not be. And so it may be pulling down some accessory factors, for example, um, that you need to you need to pick up through the use of like non-specific antibodies uh, as a control experiment. 